Hi, it's Nicole Brandon, and welcome to Hourglass Bride. I am so excited for today's show. When we created Hourglass Bride, the original intent was to bring the very best keys and tools and techniques to people that were just starting and embarking on their lives, that they were just getting married. This was the first venture into the happily ever after. And as the months went on, we realized we had people that had been married three, four, five times listening to the show wanting to get this right, this thing that we call love. And as the months went on, then we had people that had been married 25 and 50 years that were looking to deepen their relationship. And then we had people who had been raped or abused that needed to learn to trust love. And as the years have gone by, this show has expanded and extended into truly the meaning of the heart and love at a whole different level and happiness. And there are all kinds of relationships in the world. And today we're going to talk about one of the most special, astounding relationships and one of the happily ever after stories that really is a fairy tale come true. Today we are speaking with celebrity actress and author Tony Buell. And in her own right, she has accomplished and achieved so much And today she is graciously giving of her time and of her heart to share another story with you. The story of Miley the dog. A dog that went from rags to riches and touched the hearts of humanity throughout the world. So I am so honored and so grateful to have Tony with us today. Tony, welcome to the show. Happy Sunday, Dame Nicole. Happy Sunday to your friends and fans. Thank you, and a happy Sunday to you. And so for those that are new, I wanted to just take a minute to backtrack your life, which is in itself absolutely extraordinary. And I know that we brought you on as a guest as we talked about your amazing love story in the Happily Ever After. But I just wanted to touch a bit on your journey to the heart. And Go for it. Whether that's career or life So can you tell me a little bit about your acting world, your soap world, your romance, and how you stepped into today to be able to create such a loving surrounding and home for Miley? Absolutely, uh, Nicole. I guess guess you could say it started when I was little and wanted to be an actress and a writer. And when I was 19 um, and going to NYU, I also at that time got the lead in a soap opera called Love of Life on CBS at the time. And um, six months after I was on, they brought in a very, very handsome, outrageously charismatic (laughs) electric fellow named Gene Bua to be my boyfriend. And... um, Let's see, when he first came on the set, I was a very friendly girl, and I wanted him to feel welcomed. Mind you, I was still only 19. And I went up to him on the set just before we were going to go on camera for dress rehearsal, and I said, "Um, hi, Gene, welcome to the show, welcome to Love of Life. I'm Tony. And he put his finger up to his lips and went, shh, I'm preparing. (laughs) Did you know that story? No, I did not know that story. (laughs) First real meeting, and I thought, I didn't curse at the time. And, of course, Gene taught me to curse like a sailor eventually, but uh, I don't much do that anymore either. But uh, I thought to myself, what an idiot. Oh, my goodness, how am I going to work with this fellow every day? Lord. Well, we got on the set, and... As soon as the camera turned on and we started the dialogue, something happened that had never happened to me before. An electrical force ran through me, and apparently it ran through him. And then when we went on air, apparently it went over to the millions of people that were watching us on Love of Life. There was an electromagnetic attraction as if our souls were meeting and it had been destiny all along. And from that day on, I was madly in love. And uh, Gene and I went on to create amazing things together, as you know. Wow. And so, he, he was my happily ever after. There's no question uh, about it. I love that. I love that. It's real 
and it exists and it's possible because I think that that's the thing, that people that listen to this show and it's a wish or it's a dream come true. It's like the little wishing well that I'm wishing for the one I love and that love can find you. Absolutely. And, you know, the more I live, which has been quite a long time now, <laughs> the more I I see that uh, many, many kismet-like destiny type of relationships are not planned and you can't just uh, grasp them or force them or, uh, you know, you can wish upon a star, but you got to let go. you got to let go because it's like we teach in class. It's never what you think it is and anything can happen. And I would have never in a million years guessed that Gene would be my knight in shining arm, armor for all my life. I wasn't wow. looking for him. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't I- even interested in a relationship. I just wanted to act and write. And then destiny steps in. So That's to your so viewers who are longing, just let go. Just wish upon a star and wish that it's the greatest thing for your soul's growth and your partner, whoever they may be, soul's growth. And let go and get on with your life and enjoy yourself and and say thank you to the universe because your partner's already there waiting for you somewhere somewhere just around mm-hmm. the corner oh, so beautiful Tony my heart is so full as you speak it's just it's so enriching to know that that's possible and I love that it's never what you think it is and anything can happen that's an expression that you know that I've learned through you and with you and it really has changed my life that allowing of the flow and the trust, it's a whole different way of living. It is, and it, it, it makes life actually easier because you don't have tunnel vision. You have your wish, you have your dream, but it's not cemented, you know, in an idea form, which leaves the possibility for your cells and your molecules and your light body to go out there and just dance and find your best probability that's probably even better than your dream. Mm. Just magnificent, absolutely. And then you went on to create this show that changed societal history, that absolutely opened doors and windows and pathways to kids like never before and to adults like never before. And so can you share a bit about that? Because I think that's a happily ever after story as well. Yes, it is. I I take it you're talking about our musical Pepper Street, is that correct? Yes. 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 Um, <laughs> all through the 80s, Gene and I created a, a musical in Los Angeles here called Pepper Street. And uh, we it was going to be a Christmas show, you know, just uh, play Christmas time, and, and we thought that would be it. And for whatever reason in the universe, it just caught fire and played for six years, was optioned for Broadway, awarded by the White House and seven mayors, and and uh, sponsored, I think that show sponsored maybe 7,000 at-risk teens. We, we would bust them from uh, residential treatment centers and whatnot. And not just teens, sometimes adults, recovering adults, and even prisoners and their guards. And um, the story, which is about a teenage girl named Spirit, Spirit Wills, who feels like she's the only one on Pepper Street, Golden Valley, USA, who isn't perfect. Her her mother is the town evangelist and very God-fearing and strict with her people, and everybody's perfectly behaved in the chapel. And at the beginning of the show, Spirit uh, just loses all hope of ever gaining her mother's love and acceptance and she's a free spirit, and she's being squashed and squashed and squashed, and she finally takes some quaaludes with some peppermint schnapps and tries to take her own life. And her her body goes into a coma, and her spirit travels up through the tunnel of time, and she meets her, her outrageously uh, rebellious young guardian angel, Angelo. And they talk God into letting them go back to Earth as invisible peeping peeping toms for seven days to find the human side of the perfect people of Pepper Street. And that's how the adventure begins. And through the adventure, Spirit 
sees the imperfections of these wild and crazy people on Pepper Street. They see you see them perfect in the chapel, and they're able to peeping Tom behind closed doors and see each one is an absolute, you know, one's uh, bulimic, one's a cross-dresser, one's, uh, it goes on and on. The per- the perfect couple or it's just insane. Anyway, through the journey <laughs> of, of, of seeing how imperfect these people are and loving them, falling in love with them just as, as they are, with their human imperfections, she, of course, falls in love with Angelo, but at the 11th hour, she decides to live because she's learned to love herself through these imperfect people of Pepper Street, and she goes back to life with her mother and the town in Golden Valley, USA. Wow, what a gorgeous story. <laughs> it's a hero's and journey, and it related they... to it. The kids, yeah. of course, related to spirit and some of the younger people in the show, but the adults really, it really hit the adults just as much. And people would come to see Pepper Street like 50 and 100 times. And the way we work, the way Jean taught acting, it's, uh, which was cast directly from Acting for Life, it's spontaneous. So the words are the same each night, of course, but just like in class, the behavior and feelings that rise up are allowed to be expressed just as they are under the text. So everybody that came had a new, different, outrageously healing experience every single time. Well, I'm so glad you said that because that was my question, the why the mega success. The why, I mean, I've heard stories where people dropped to their knees and were grateful to someone who brought them or apologize to somebody for saying, you know, I didn't want to come and thank you so much for opening my heart and my eyes and the doorway to a show like this, to an experience like this. And so was there a like nugget? People were dragged me? there. They didn't yes. want to come, especially like for even, even I'll go to the, you know, the extreme, but the prisoners that came with their guards and their arms folded and like, you know, nothing can touch me. We're standing and weeping and applauding at the end. And my favorite thing is that strangers would turn to each other. I'm sorry, I get emotional about this. Would turn to each other and just embrace each other. It was just amazing. It was an amazing, blessed experience. And once again, another fairy tale in our life. Mm. I love that you have chapters and each chapter is a fairy tale. It's sort of like Disney has Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty. (laughs) One after the other, another fairy tale come true, another dream come true. And and now you have a new Of course it's a fairy tale, but this, you know, like Grimm's fairy tales, there's some, you know, dark sides as well. So not everything is all sunshine and flowers all the time, just like life, you know. Right. And, you know, and I love to talk about that. And I guess one of the stories that, you know, we're talking about today was a story of a life of a dog who had a, a dark, dark, dark start. And I would love you to share because Miley's story yes. was a sweeping success. I mean, there I have friends that live out of the country. I have friends that live across the nation in Philadelphia, New York, and they were posting on their websites, not knowing I knew you, not knowing that I knew Wiley. They were posting on their homepages Miley stories. Yeah, I know. Isn't it it outrageous? It's just remarkable. Talk about a fairy tale. Wow. So for those that I can't imagine there's anybody out there that doesn't know Miley, but we have people listening from all over the world. And so can you share from the beginning the once upon a time there was this dog? I'd love to. Well, first of all, it's on um, on the day after Valentine's Day, February 15th is going to be our year anniversary. I cannot believe that Miley and I have a family for almost a year now. I just, it seems almost like yesterday. Anyway, a year ago, um, Miley was living, or a little more than a year ago, uh, actually it was Thanksgiving, a year ago Thanksgiving, Miley had grown up. She'd been tossed in a junkyard in South Central Los Angeles. 
and because she grew up um, walking in sewerage and uh, filth and somehow survived since she was about a three-month-old puppy until she was, gosh, I guess it must have been, they think it had to be at least nine months for her to become in that condition that uh, the rescue went, when the rescue went viral. She had parasites, she had bacteria, she had mange, she had very little fur left on her husky body. Um, her, her paws were swollen like ham hocks, and yet she somehow kept forging on what a spirit that dog has. When they found her, they mm-hmm. figured she may, might have had maybe a week or two left, and yet she was still, you know, there she was, still lifting her head, and she was found on the junk pile by Eldad of Hope for Paws. Some good Samaritan must have seen her and uh, called up. I don't know why they waited for nine months or why didn't somebody else call. I do not know. We'll never know that or how she got to the junkyard in the first place. But Eldad and his lucky leash and his helper put the leash around her neck, and she was able to even hobble to his car and uh, and be healed, had several surgeries, and took a few months to you know, become whole again as best she could. And she is. And today she's like the most healthy, robust, 70-pound Nordic star. She's snow white with ice blue eyes and is kind to everyone and every animal. I don't know how that happened from being on alert in South Central with the screaming and the gunshots and the traffic that she must have endured and God knows what. Um, but she is just wow. the most beautiful girl. And her rescue, Eldad's rescue, and Hope for Paul's rescue went viral. And when I first saw her on Facebook, she had, I think, five or ten million fans that were following her. And at that point, there were 500 families from around the world who wanted to adopt her. She touched so many people's hearts. And um, they selected, I think it was four or five families from the Los Angeles area because they wanted to keep their eye on her and they wanted her to be close. So they selected the Los Angeles area and visited, I believe, four families, and I was one of the four families. And um, when Sheila from um, uh, Fuzzy Pets Adoption Foundation called me and told me that I was being considered, I was just blown away because I didn't think I had a chance in the world of, of becoming this this creature's mommy with all the fans she had. And I said, why? Why are you considering me? And she said, because, Tony, you wrote directly to Miley. You didn't write to the foundation. You wrote to Miley and you said, dear Miley, we've both been through hell and back. And we have a second chance at life. Even if you don't choose me to be your mom, you've saved me. You've opened up my heart again because, as you might know, I've lost my husband to Parkinson's last year, Jean Bua, and I didn't think I'd ever have a real full life or a full heart again. And just watching your, your rescue has just opened me up. I just looked at you and fell in love. So even if you don't choose me, I'll always love you. Love, Tony. And apparently this touched Sheila's heart and the foundation's heart. And when they came over to meet me in my home, and I've also had four other huskies. Jean and I had four other huskies, so that probably helped. And the house, which is called Casabua, is surrounded by major, huge gates and protective area all around it on all four sides. So there's no way a dog could escape this property. So I guess having four other Huskies and having the house and um, having written to Miley, I guess I guess they were really considering me. And then when Miley came in and they all came in, she, we looked at each other and she wouldn't leave my side. She just would not leave my side. And as Sheila said, it was like family finding each other, long-lost family finding each other. And I had to wait another month. (laughs) It's like adopting a child. They're very, very strict and very careful, which is a wonderful thing. And finally I got the call that I was to be Miley's mom. 
and that's my story. And the year has just been just magical with Miley, and I, I'm crazy. She's my daughter. I'm crazy about her, and we're inseparable. That's wow. Miley the dog. <laughs> that's so amazing, Tony. And when she arrived after that month, what was that like as she walked through those gates and walked into the house and through the door and you knew that you now both had this life that you are now beginning together? I My heart was pounding. We had a red carpet from the gates to the front door for her with her name on it. Um, I had a lot of my team that that uh, creates with me and, and works with me here and they brought the entire Fuzzy Pets Foundation over with Miley. And as we walked up the red carpet and she came through the gate and to the front door, she was very rather demure. And then when she got in the house and Sheila took the leash off her, she went berserk. She jumped up and down and went and danced in circles and wagged her tail and ran from one person to the other as if, you know, as if every second was Christmas for her. And then she came to me, and that was it, and we were inseparable. She's the happiest girl in the world, and that she's made me the happiest girl in the world as well. That's so spectacular, and I'm so pleased that it worked. And I would love you to share a little bit about Fuzzy Paws as a foundation and then also adopting a pet, because so many people don't even realize how a dog, a cat, a, an animal that is in desperate need can actually change and enhance your life. It can change everything. A pet, whether it be a dog, a cat, a bunny. Um, I know my friend has an iguana. They're, they're, it's something to love and something to focus on and something to give to. And they, especially dogs, they, they just give. That, that's what they were, seem to be born for. They just give and love unconditionally. They don't care what you look, look like or, you know, or if you're smelly or in a bad mood or if you're weeping or whatever. They just love you. They're there to love you and, and, and nurture you and just heal you. They're just angels from God. And the ones that are rescued, especially, I've had I've had gone to breeders for two of my huskies, but then I realized that they have purebreds. If you're married to a particular breed, there's all the breeds that are either tossed away or lost or strayed, and you can get any kind of dog that your heart desires from a rescue. And those dogs know. Those dogs know that you've come that you've opened your heart to them and that you need them and they will be by your side forevermore and and love you like there's no tomorrow they know so i would just tell all of your friends all over the world to get a rescue pet no matter what kind of pet you want get a rescue pet they're out there they need you they need your home and they'll give you unconditional love for the rest of your life for the rest of their mm-hmm. life that's so special. It really is. And then if you can't have a pet, if you live somewhere where for whatever reason pets are not allowed, first you shouldn't live in places where pets are not allowed, but if you do, um, I would love you to talk about supporting a local foundation that does rescue pets and the importance of being and able you, to support. Lord, yes, you can yes. volunteer to to go either help rescue or help take take uh, care at the facility as they're healing or as they're waiting for their forever home. You just uh, look up Google or whatever you do around the world, um, you know, rescue, dog, cat, whatever animal you're interested in, and uh, it will guide you to somewhere that's close to you where you can volunteer and where you can pour your love and get love from these wonderful creatures for, you know, as often as you want or can, and um, that I guess that's what I would do if I couldn't have a, a a doggy here at my place where I live. I would go and volunteer at the local shelter or one of the rescue houses 
There's mm. many, many wonderful rescue places that um, that you can find wherever you are. Absolutely, and I would love you to share just a minute about Fuzzy Paws specifically and what the organization and who they are and the tremendous yes. work that they're doing. Now, Fuzzy Paws is the adoption agency, but they also rescue and heal. Uh, Hope for Paws and Eldad, he's the one that went out to the junkyard, and he's the he's the one, he goes all over the place and, and goes into outrageous conditions, and yet so does Sheila from Fuzzy Pets. So they both rescue, and but Sheila's in charge of the adoption side of it. So they work together. It's It's a wonderful, mm-hmm. wonderful thing. Fuzzy Pets Foundation is the adoption agency. Now, Sheila was here for Christmas Eve. Um, Miley has given me so much. I had a, one of my Christmas Eve parties for about 100 of my friends that I never thought would happen again. It's something Jean and I enjoy doing, and I haven't done it since uh, 2011 because he was gone and I didn't have the heart. But Miley opened mine, and I was able to have my Christmas Eve party. And Sheila and the foundation were invited. They came. Eldad couldn't come because he was out on Christmas Eve rescuing. And when Sheila was here, she got a call, and off she went in the middle of Christmas Eve night to rescue some other dog somewhere, probably some outrageously horrible, dangerous place. And that they, these people are such heroes. They just go and do these things just for the love of the animals. It's remarkable. So um, I will be forever indebted to both these organizations, both Hope for Paws and uh, Fuzzy Pets Foundation, and um, I will always be donating and finding ways to to support those organizations. They are just heroes. That's and without great. them, and there are videos. I would not. Absolutely, and and I seem to remember that there are videos of her rescue. Yes, on YouTube, that now she has ni- over 19 million fans and hits on YouTube. Just go to Miley the Dog, Mi- not Smiley, Miley, Miley the Dog on uh, YouTube and see her rescue, see her adoption, see her running around with me. And she has uh, thousands of friends on Facebook, also under Miley the Dog. You can join her Facebook page, and she makes a video about every three days and talks to her fans and her friends for about 45 seconds with some a little bit of love and light for everybody, and everybody seems to love when she talks to them. I just did one this morning with her on her hike. Mm-hmm. They're so <laughs> sweet, and they're so touching, and they always make you smile. They always make you feel good. They always make you feel better about your day. There's just something. First, every time you look at them, you remember where she came from. I don't think there's a way even a year later that you can look at the video and say, I don't remember the treachery. I don't remember the pain. I don't remember looking at these pictures, you know, these barren and just the excruciating circumstances. And then look at her now. Look at her so happy. Look at her so joyful. Look at her play. Look at her with friends and family and you know, and, and all these different aspects of life as the seasons change. And so just the, their inspirational vignettes of life and possibility. Absolutely. Look what love can do. That's, or she said you know, at this Christmas to her fra- fans, what a difference a Christmas can make. You know, mm-hmm. it's all about love. It's all about love and opening your heart. Sometimes when you least expect it. Wow, so beautiful. And then you were saying since it's been a year, Valentine's is going to be a year. And so tell me about Miley's year. Because I know some extraordinary things are just about to launch and happen. And I know in the year you're saying you have the Facebook page, she has a website, she has all these fans. So did she have healing? Did she have counseling? Did she have therapy? Or what did it take from the time that she came to your door to now the Miley that's an inspirational speaker to humanity? (laughs) Well, first of all, the three months before she came to me, of course, she was healing at, uh, at Fuzzy Pets Foundation and being taken care of with her skin and her eyes 
They thought she would have to have an eye operation, and yet she, it, they healed herself. And um, so when I got her, she was already already very healthy. And I didn't want to do too much television with her. I didn't want to do too much with her. I wanted her to be a regular dog for a long time first. You know, I just wanted her to have the most normal, loving, safe, almost quiet, almost quiet existence so she could complete healing and feel really safe and know that she was never going anywhere but right here next to me with in my heart. And she did, she knows knows that, and she's known that for a long time. Um, she was a slight bit skittish at first with certain men with deep dark voices, big men and hats. Um, I don't know what happened in that junkyard in that garbage dump. Um, uh, you can only guess, and that's all it would be is a guess. But you know, I, she wasn't beaten because I, I, she her body did she didn't hide under things and stuff. But she would bark at men with dark voices for a while and be very weary in guarding me. That subsided as soon as she got to know the person and as soon as she knew she was safe and that I was safe. So that subsided. Uh, Her appetite just became wonderful. And, of course, I feed her the greatest, wonderful, healthy stuff with no bad things in it. So she's really healthy, and she loves vegetables, interestingly enough. She loves broccoli and asparagus, go figure. And um, she's just, uh, she has several beds she likes to sleep on and in. She's got her own room. She's got her own small bedroom where she had her own Christmas tree, where she can go and take her own space, take time out if she needs to. She can go any room, anywhere, and she ends up on my bed, of course, at night. I, I love that, that we sleep together, and she's just so affectionate and wonderful. I love petting her so much. She's so beautiful. And um, then eventually I started, you know, taking her out a little bit and uh, taking her to the dog park and taking her to something called Bow Wow Bungalow, where she, we just got home from there now, where she can run on acreage with lots of other dogs and be social and uh, keep that up with, for her so she can get along with other animals really, really easily and really, really, really well and have fun. And then um, on my birthday, which was two days after Christmas, Fox News sent a limousine for us. I'm sure it was mostly for Miley, absolutely. And we did an interview on my birthday on Fox News, which was a lot of fun, about Miley. And um, so she had her first ride in a limousine. She seemed to enjoy that very much. And now I'm writing a screenplay about her. It's it's time. It's time to tell her story because she's so inspirational for so many millions of people. I think her story should be told. And, of course, it'll be part fantasy because nobody knows what happened in that junkyard when she was a puppy, so I made that up. But a lot of it's real. And um, so I'll save that as a surprise for your your viewers as as that moves along. I'm having a wonderful time writing it. I'm working with some a wonderful mentor called Michael Pfeiffer, who's uh, the director producer of many of the movies that uh, Gene and I wrote songs for on Hallmark and Lifetime. He's also a wonderful uh, writer himself and a wonderful producer director. So he's mentoring me for this film script, and um, we'll see what happens. It's Hollywood, so you never know, but it's coming along beautifully. I wake up with storyline, and I share it with Miley, and I read the script to Miley, and she just loves it when I read it to her, of course, because she hears her name, Miley, over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) She's amazing. I'm sure I'm I'm channeling her. I'm sure she's she's speaking to me. I can't wait for this movie to come out. This is In my super conscious, be... telling whatever story she'd like to be told, whatever fairy tale she'd like to tell. So oh that's what goodness. we're up to. going to be incredible. How touching, how lighthearted, how stupendous. It's just one of the best stories. You can just almost see the little stars, <laughs> the little pixie dust, the magic surrounding this, because it truly is a story that's It's funny that you say that exactly what's in it. You pick that up, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I'm happy to be able to be on the wavelength of Miley and her You're incredible You're on the wavelength story. of everything wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you, my darling. And then you touched on something that I just want to backtrack for a, for a second. You said, when Gina and I wrote songs for Hallmark and whatever, and now I'm writing this screenplay. And so one of the things we talk about on this show is passion. And so can you talk about your passion for writing? Oh, sure. Um, Like many writers, I guess I'm obsessed. I get an idea or uh, an inspiration, and I I get up in the middle of the night and start writing or writing lyrics or a story or a script for you guys for class. Um, I'm, You know, it just sweeps me. It sweeps me into a whole other realm. It's like magic. It can be anything it can be a fairy tale it can be actually it can be a thriller it can be anything you guys need in the class you know whatever whatever i my heart feels you guys need i can just think about you and write it and have it done the next day watch you guys do it and hopefully it'll be healing for you um this morning i woke up with the climax for for the screenplay for molly and I had I would never have guessed it would take place where it's taking place, and it was wonderful. So I jotted that down, and when I get to that part, I'll you know there it'll be waiting waiting for me to hopefully fill it out and get out of the way of whatever my talent, my angels, God, whatever wants to express itself. So it's it's a very passionate way to live, and Jean lives that way, and we live that way together with whatever we created and um, just prayed that it'll be healing and wonderful and just get out of the, get out of our head, let our heart and our talent and God do the work. Okay. So I want to ask you a touchy subject. I know that with Jean's Parkinson's and your own health issues, you know, mm-hmm. which we can talk about if you feel comfortable talking about that. But I know Anything, that my life's an open your book. darkest Nicole, no problem. time, thank you, during the darkest time, you continued to write. And some of the things that you have written during those time periods are some of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Oh, thank you. And so you. I'm wondering <laughs> how, how does one capture that humor and that joy and that glee and that whatever that is when you're in pain or turmoil or fear or how does somebody do that? Well, let me see. I'll tell you what I've always done. Um, I simply do a lot of what we do in class. However, if I'm home or elsewhere, I'll light a candle and I'll sit quietly and wait. I have my either my computer, my laptop, or a um, piece of paper and a pen, and I'll wait. If I'm writing a song, I'll usually get the title. I'll write this title down and wait. If Jean's written the melody, or now Brandon Jarrett, who I work with a lot now, it has written a melody first, I'll listen to it over and over again. I'll listen to it over and over again again, until it becomes my cells and my molecules, and I'll sit there and I'll wait. I won't try and figure it out. And then I I find myself in an emotional condition. And many times I'll open and and ask my angels, God, my talent, to, to express itself through me, and I'll weep, and I'll wait. And then all of a sudden, I'll hear words or see uh, an image, and I'll write it down. And then there it goes. Then we're off and running. And I can usually complete something in a few hours, you know, if it's not an entire script, of course. That's amazing. And I know that the ritual, as you're sharing this ritual, is so beautiful. And I was just thinking, gosh, I would love to do that when I write. Light a candle, say a prayer, blessing, sit and wait. And I so appreciate you sharing that. And then I also know there are times that you've been in hospitals. And maybe that ritual wasn't possible. And then exactly. do you still turn to the writing? 
yes. Um, let me explain to your viewers what you're talking about so they know. Um, during Gene's 13 years of Parkinson's, which was he was the bravest soul on earth, he never complained. He taught until he couldn't even speak anymore. Um, during that time, the last, uh, it was 2010, um, I found a lump on my breast when I was showering. I'd lost my spongy, and so I had to put the soap on my hand and do it. And I had skipped my mammogram that year because Jean had had two brain operations. And I wanted to stay with him other than go and have my mammogram. It's the only year I didn't have it. And I found a lump on my breast on January 11th, 2011, which is 11111, which I just realized the other day for the first time. I guess in numerology that's something big. I have, I'm not schooled in that, so I don't really know. Um, the doctor found my breast. I went into the doctor the same day. He did a stat, and um, I had uh, I had breast cancer, a great big lump in my breast. And uh, they operated and took it out, and I was in uh, remission for six months while I was still taking care of Jean. And then six months later, it had grown into my lung. The breast cancer had spread into my lung. So that means you have stage four. Once it spreads into somewhere else, another organ, it's stage four. So I had stage four breast cancer. And in 2012, I had, no, that was true. In 2012, they found that and tried to chemo it away and and radiation it away. And that November, Jean passed away. And I was still having, you know, tons of chemo and radiation. Um, in 2013, I had three surgeries where they cut that one out. And uh, but I had to continue to have chemo, and I may always have to have it because I've got stage four, and there's something called floaters that can turn into lesions or tumors if you don't keep having the stuff pumped in into you and I have something called triple negative which is an extremely aggressive chap it's uh, it's more aggressive than the other ones so I just choose not to mess around with it so every three weeks I have chemo I go into the hospital I have something called a port in my in my um, left uh, breast and they give me chemo for four hours and while I'm there I take my laptop I open it up I look around. It's real nice there. They have a waterfall, and the nurses are great, and the, my oncologist, Dr. Berkowitz, is fantastic. And they know what I'm doing, and they bring me, like, cranberry juice and leave me alone, and I write a funny funny script very often for you guys for class. And it makes my the four hours fly by, and I laugh, and, and the people around me know what I'm doing, and, and they're having the same thing, and sometimes they laugh too, and the nurses are laughing, and it's a, a wonderful way to focus on on a creative endeavor and thinking of you doing it maybe the next day or the day after, and the hours fly by, and it's, you know, it's like it just is. It is what it is, and I choose to have a perception and focus on something wonderful other than what some people might you know, consider some hideous experience. So that's what I do in the hospital. I write often comedies. Uh So can you offer any advice to the listeners out there and to people that are in the audience that when they're in a dark space, how they can either vision their way out of it as you talk about, you know that it's out there and it's possible, or to find the humor or to find the task or the thing that you enjoy? Absolutely. The first thing that came to my mind when you said that, Nicole, is to tell your friends to partner with nature. Go out and look at a plant, a tree, a mountain, a body of water, a flower. Watch the birds fly. Look what Mother Nature has to give us. It's a miracle every day. 
Every day I wake up and I breathe and I, I thank God, I thank universe, I thank spirit for this amazing adventure called life. With all its ups and downs, with all its grim fairy tales, with all its magic fairy tales, it is what it is. It's a school. It's a hard school. It's a school full of challenges. And yet, what does our soul get to do during these amazing experiences? It it gets to grow and grow and have this amazing experience that we might not ever have again. Maybe we have. Maybe you believe in many lifetimes. Maybe you believe on different levels, you know, different experiences on different levels. But you'll never be you again, even if you have, this is what Angelo tells Spirit in Pepper Sheet, even if you have a hundred other lifetimes on a thousand of other stars, there'll never be another you. The name you are this time, the you you are this time, you have an opportunity a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity every single minute, every single day to see your journey through the eyes of hope, through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of love. You can choose to do that. You don't have to go down the dark tunnel all the time. You can get right out of it and choose to see the light, choose to see the beauty, choose to see the hero's journey, the hero that you are, and go on that path. It's never what you think it is. Anything can happen. Oh, Tony, that's just extraordinary. I feel like I'm floating right now. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. And I love the fact as you talk about your writing, that you're writing these scenes, you're writing this screenplay, you've written this music and these songs for these shows and films and that you were such a prolific writer but it was the letter to Miley that opened the doorway for Miley to have this life she's now leading apparently so and as far as my job and my part of her life goes absolutely it was obviously the letter caught Sheila and the foundation's attention and Miley's Personal is always good, you know? And when you said that you both are living a second life or have a second chance for life, do you think that we all have second chances? I think we have second chances, third chances, fourth chances. I think we have every chance that we choose to take. We can not see that light in the corner of our eye. You know, we can... We can have tunnel vision and just uh, go down what our heads are saying, like, this is, this is a, t- why me? Why me? This is terrible. Why did this have to happen to me? Um, out of all the people in the world, why me? Why me? This is dark. I'm feeling sad. I don't know how to get out of it. I'm just, I'll just stay in bed for the rest of my life or close my eyes or bury my head in the sand. We can choose to do that, you know. But when you can choose not to do that, when we've been given a chance to to see life in a different way and open our eyes and get out of bed, take a shower and look at a tree and breathe and make any choice, any choice that we want to that day to see things in a new way, a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. Every day is a new chance. Take it. Grab it. Grab it by the gillionis and run with it. Mm-hmm. Open so your heart. Exciting. I Open feel like I'm heart. running with a kite right now. As you're saying all of this, I just have the image of running and soaring a kite. It feels that freeing and that opening and just watching the kite dance in the sky with your words. What a beautiful image, Nicole. Now listen, mm-hmm. when Jean passed, Uh, A couple months later, my husky, Anushka, after 13 years, passed. And I was alone in this big house for eight months. I didn't fill it in with another creature or with a roommate or anything like that. I decided to see what it was like to feel whatever I felt and be in the silence for eight months. And I wasn't happy. I was not happy. Um... You know, there were lots of dark moments. 
And in those dark moments, I'd go out on the deck, and I, like I just said a little while ago, I'd look at the mountain and look at the tree and breathe and wait. Mm. And then came Miley. And there's a Miley for everybody. There's a Miley for everybody, a dog, a person, a friend. Mm -hmm. They're just around the corner. Don't give up. Just say thank you and wait. Mm. Well, that's the best advice ever, and I know that we only have a couple minutes left, and so I'm going to ask you for something very special you had that happily ever after fairy tale romance, the one that everybody wishes and wants and dreams about from the time that they're small. And so for our listeners out there, do you have any keys or secrets or just something that you can, a nugget you can share to make a marriage and a relationship work? Let me see. I saw Gene every day as a new person. I didn't put him in a um, in a tunnel vision. I didn't think I knew him. He was always a mystery to me. I always appreciated everything about him as if it was new every day. And when we got upset or mad, we'd just breathe and we'd take a little time out and then pretty soon, you know, the the thunders dies down of being angry or whatever, and you get back together and and um, work it out. You know, it, it's not magic, but I I I looked at him new and mysterious every day, like I was meeting a new person. And I think he also felt that way. We never, never, never took each other for granted. I think that may might be the key. And we loved creating together. So I would definitely say if you even if you're not working together, find an activity that you just are both enchanted by and do it together. Whether it be dancing or hiking or running like Jean and I used to 7 miles a day or e- painting or or even going to the movies, whatever your passion you have, find one that you love to do together. And make sure that there's you make time for that as if it's the most important thing in the world. Thank you. That's such beautiful advice. Um, I'm sure there's yeah. better advice, and I'm sure that there's more I can dig up if I had a moment to feel no, more. No, that was perfect. And then what about in, in, in relationship to your pet? Is there a way to develop a better relationship with your pet? Listen, listen to listen to your pet. Take time and l- look and and l- allow yourself to feel what your your pet is feeling. Even if they look blank, you know they don't have the same expressions as people. If you open up, and I keep using this word with you today, I don't always use it, but wait, just open and wait. Take space. And be with your animal, and you'll have a, a wonderful communication, and you'll know what your animal needs. You'll you'll hear you'll hear hear it. You'll feel it, and then mm-hmm. take action, whatever it is, and pl- make room for playtime, just like with a person. Make room for the playtime. You think you're playing for them. You think you're rescuing them, but it's really them that's rescuing you, and you are petting and playing. And it makes you feel open. It makes you your heart feel good. It makes you feel like you're giving. It's wonderful. There's nothing nothing like it. Just share. Share. Mm-hmm. And I love that you call Miley your daughter and that you are a family, that you don't consider her your pet, but she is a part of you and a part of your life. And if more people could do that, I think that that would also deepen the relationship and open the heart even more. Absolutely. And just like with people, you know, when you your voice is very important to your pet, just like it is with your child or your friend or whoever, be be cautious, be mindful, be loving when you talk. 
even if even if you're upset, if you're screaming at at a creature, you're it's 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 badgering them. It's battery, just like when you're screaming at a person out of control. Don't do it. Breathe and choose not to. Oh, we take so a different. Appreciate you. Yes, you're going to say choose a different path, and I love yeah. the path you have stepped onto the path, the road that you have forged, the one that you have danced upon and strutted upon and uphill, downhill, through all of these side roads that your life has taken to you, that you've brought music and harmony and love and joy and happiness and the fact that you can sit down and even in your darkest times, decide that you are going to find humor inside of yourself to share with the world and find love inside of yourself to share with the world. And I know that everybody that's listening to the show and everybody that's in our audience is anxiously awaiting for the movie and for the film to come out of Miley the Dog. And I know it's going to be absolutely spectacular. And as we wrap up the show, if you can just let people know how they could find you or how they could find Miley and follow her and be part of her journey and your journey in her light. Sure, Nicole. Once again, thank you, Dame Nicole, for this beautiful opportunity to speak with you, which is always an honor, and with your friends and fans. You can find Miley on Miley the Dog on Facebook or Miley the Dog on YouTube. And it has all kinds of fun things. And for me, you can go to Bua, B-U-A, actingforlife.com. Bua, B-U-A, actingforlife.com and you'll see all kinds of fun stuff and enjoy (laughs) I guess I'll go be with Miley now and I'm going to make a Super Bowl dinner for us (laughs) (laughs) well that sounds special and spectacular and we wish you health and happiness and joy and love and light and you are such a blessing in your humanity your heart, your spirit, your soul, and all you do for everyone. You are such an inspiration, as is Miley, and we thank you both for being on the show today and uh, wish you... Welcome, Nicole. You're so welcome to me and Miley and Jean Buell on Wings. I send love and light to you and your fans. Uh Well, we look forward to having you on again and love to you. Wow, what a beautiful guest. So we are wishing you all, Tony Buer, Miley Buer, Jean Buer, and myself, Nicole Brandon, we are wishing you happily ever after, knowing that each and every one of your dreams can come true.